Hello, everybody, and welcome back. For those of you just joining us, we are getting ready to start our quarterfinal match here at the StarCityGames.com Worcester Open, brought to you by Ultimate Guard. Jeff Hoagland, our number one ranked player on our Player of the Year leaderboard, is on Mono Red Sneak Attack, coming to the top eight and third seed. Joel Asset, our third ranked player on our Player of the Year leaderboard on Miracles, coming in in third seed. He's going to have the option to play or draw in this match. Boz has picked Jeff Hoagland. Let's see what happens here in this matchup. Let's get these players battling. I think the fact that uh, Jeff is going to be on the draw is also going to be something that's pretty important in this matchup. This is definitely going to be a matchup where tempo is going to matter for Jeff. And the fact that he's on the draw is a, you know, a minor unfortunate disadvantage for him, but I still think he's going to be able to overcome and take down Joe. Looks like both players are going to start out on seven, and action is going to uh, get going here. Joe's going to start off with a flood stranded pass. No turn one fireworks for Jeff Hoagland. He's just going to play a mountain and pass it back to Joe Lissette. I would expect Jeff to do something pretty powerful on these opening turns. Again, I've said this over and over again, but the combo decks, they really like to get some sort of big advantage on the first three turns of the game. And then after that point is when the Miracles deck starts to take over. Well, Joe is just going to play a second Flooded Strand and pass back to Jeff. Jeff's going to play an Ancient Tomb, take two points of damage, and cast a copy of Blood Moon. Let's see how Joe responds. So with these two fetch lands, there's a chance that Joe just lets this resolve. This is... Uh, the kind of situation where a lot of times if you can avoid interacting with something, you will, because that means you just have more interaction for the things that really matter. So I'm curious to see if Joe just fetches two basics and lets this resolve, or if he wants to counter it. The main advantage of countering it is it would mean that Joe's uh, cards like Brainstorm and uh, Sensei's Divining Top would still have a lot of their value because those cards are best paired with shuffle effects most commonly in the form of uh, fetch lands. Well, Joe is going to fall to 18 and go find an island and a plains. Let's see if he decides to let this resolve like Andy talked about or countered. He is just going to let it resolve. Now his fetch lands are going to be pretty dead, but he does already have two blue and one white, which is really all he needs. He's going to play an island and land a counterbalance. Jeff's going to have quite a bit of mana available to him here if he has some Seething Song type cards in his hand. Let's see and, what he decides to go with. And the, another advantage of Joe allowing this to happen is if Joe only has one Force of Will in his hand, if he Force of Will's this Blood Moon, but then Jeff just follows it up with a sneak attack, Joe may feel like a little bit of a buffoon because he countered the non-lethal threat. And so Joe, uh, you know, it's typically pretty good for him to be frugal with his counter magic, if possible. Well, Joe is just going to play a Caracas and pass the turn back to Jeff. He has a fourth land and a Seething Song. All right, Counterbalance Trigger is going to resolve. It will reveal a Tundra on top of his deck. Let's see if the Seething Song is going to resolve or not. A lot of times Looks I like, like to yes. let the Ritual resolve and then counter the meaningful card that's coming up afterwards. All right, well, here comes a Inferno Titan. Jeff is reminding Joe he does have a counterbalance trigger on the stack if he wishes to use it. But here is a Venser Shaper Ooh. Savant is going to return that back to Jeff's hand. And this is another good reason to just let the Blood Moon resolve. It's because you can Venser it later on. Most Miracles decks, game one, they have no way of dealing with the resolved Blood Moon. All right, Venser is going to attack Jeff down to 16. Joe's going to play a land for the turn and pass back to Jeff. And this is also a great play pattern for Joe because this means that now he's hit his, he's had, this Venser has bought time for him to fit his, hit his fifth land drop and he'll be able to hard cast a Force of Will rather than pitching a blue card to it. All right, so Jeff is going to use another Seething Song to get out an Inferno Titan. Joe set will counter it with a Force of Will, attack back for two with that Venser Shaper's bond. And this game would be quite different without Venser. So again, Joe's unique card choice is really paying off all right, well here is a Batter Skull now. Batter Skull is a little harder to race. Joe is going to brainstorm with the counterbalance trigger on this deck. If he has a Force Will already in hand, he can get that on top and use it to counter the Batter Skull. Which looks like that's what he's going to do. So 
So it looks like they're, they're working out some clarity on the sequencing. But one thing that's so interesting about this match is before we saw Jeff Hoogland play against a Miracles player, and the Blood Moon hit play, and it was so awkward for the Miracles player. And in this particular case, it seems like Joe is able to navigate this situation perfectly, ensuring that you know, he's able to slog through this Blood Moon and deal with some of the other harder hitting permanents that are coming up afterwards. Well, that Force Will on top is going to counter the Batter Skull. Joe is going to take his turn, attack Jeff for two with that Vencer, play a land and pass the turn back. Here comes another Blood Moon for Jeff. And a redundant Blood Moon is not particularly exciting. You want to have a good uh, density of Blood Moons. You want to have a lot of them so that you hit them frequently in the early part of the game. But now that, now that we're here, they're not particularly good top decks. Yeah, well, Jeff is just not able to draw anything here. Joe is just going to keep attacking with this Venser over and over again. And this Venser is doing work. Joe just has, or Jeff just has another land, going to pass the turn back. It might just do like the full 18 points of damage here. And this is one of the things that I love about a mid-range control deck is when you can make it so that your threats are also answers. This is why, like for example, in modern Jund, I'm such a big fan of Olivia Valderin, is because it allows you to make ensure that you always have the interaction you need with every single card that you can possibly draw without having to uh, be caught in a situation where you don't have a way to win the game. Jeff is going to try a Chalice of the Void, X equals 1. Counterbalance will not counter it, but a Spell Snare out of Joe's hand will take care of it. Just going to pass the turn back to Jeff. He knows that he still has to work through this Force Will that's in Jeff's hand. He's going to cast a Lotus Petal. Counterbalance is going to reveal a Swords to Plowshares. Here comes the Sneak Attack. This will likely prompt that Force of Will out of, jo out of Joe's hand. And Joe Lissette really has put on a master class of how to navigate through these matches. He's done everything so well. I mean, he's up against a combo deck, and he has not pitched a blue card to his Force of Will. He's just hard cast them, which is phenomenal. All right, Joe's just going to play a land and pass back. It's like Jeff drew another batter skull. Let's see if we can get this to resolve. And this is a good card. Joe only has access to one white mana, so he can he cannot hard cast a terminus. He does have his Swords to Plowshares, so which can get rid of the germ. But that still gives Jeff a couple turns to bounce it back to his hand and replay it. Yep. Joe's so close to actually closing this game out. If he can find another Force of Will on the top of his library, that would likely be game. We'll see what he can do. He's going to brainstorm in response. He also could find another copy of Vencer to oh, bounce actually, the germ. He's cast two Force of Wills. He only has one left, right? He does only have one Ooh, left. The, the numbers are not in his favor. And a resolved batter skull is actually pretty hard for the Miracles deck to deal with. Joe doesn't have a card like Wear and Tear in his main deck. He has it in his sideboard. He doesn't have a card like Council's Judgment to deal with it. So he's going to be able to source the plowshares, this batter scope, but that is not a long-term solution. Source the plowshares is going to take care of that germ. It's going to put Jeff up to six. Venser is going to attack him down to four. And you get a land and a pass from Joe. One of the best things that uh, Joe could do is find another brainstorm and somehow engineer a situation where he has a card like Entreat the Angels on top of his library. That would be, hands down, the best thing possible. This All is pretty right. good too, though. Well, Jeff is going to be able to bounce and replay that batter skull, but Joe does have access to Snapcaster Mage with Force of Will backup. And that Snapcaster Mage will be the third and fourth points of damage to make a lethal attack on the following turn. Man, that is that was a pretty sweet game. So Joe Lissette is going to take game one here uh, against Jeff Hoagland. Let's take a look at the sideboards and see what kind of options that Joe's going to have. He's got one Swords to Plowshares, two Moat, two Wear Tear, one Coastal X Return, two Red Elemental Blast, two copies of Rest in Peace, two copies of Back to Basics, and three Flusterstorm. What do we think Joe's going to bring in? So I think it's a, a little interesting because Jeff isn't playing a stock deck 
Joe probably didn't build his sideboard with this matchup in mind. I think the card that he's likely going to bring in is actually Moat. It doesn't deal with Emrakul, it doesn't deal with Grizzlebrand, but it essentially blanks all the other fatties. And he knows that because Jeff is playing a mono red deck, that Jeff will have no way to deal with a resolved moat. So I think there's a good chance that moat comes in. Wear Tear has a lot of utility in the matchup. I think that will also come in. And you can make a good argument for Flusterstorm, but uh, Flusterstorm doesn't counter Sneak Attack, doesn't counter Inferno Titan. There are a lot of cards that it doesn't counter. So I think it's mostly just going to be the two moats and the two wear tears. I can see that. Now on Jeff's side, we have two Pyrostatic Pillar, three Trinisphere, two Pyromancy, two Sudden Shock, two Shattering Spree, one Boil, two Magus of the Moon, and one copy of Pyroclasm. What do you think Jeff's going to bring in? I think he's going to bring in Boil. You had mentioned that Pyromancy could be another good option also, but I think Boil is really the card that Jeff has that's going to be have a, a major impact in these post-board games. That is true. And again, we have another Blood Moon deck here. Jeff was able to resolve it game one against Joe Lissette, but it didn't do much because Joe didn't have a lot of non-basics on the battlefield. He was able to solidify his mana base with basic lanes. Non-basics are a key factor in Legacy, and if you, have, if you need to get some for yourself, you can check out the non-basic land sale going on here for our weekly sale at StarCityGames.com. It does end Monday at 10.59 a.m. If you need expeditions, wastelands, shocks, fetches, you can check out some sweet deals over at StarCityGames.com for the weekly sale on non-basic lands. It does end Monday at 10.59 a.m. And I also want to remind everybody that we have recently restocked our non-English cards. Oh, yeah, definitely so, check those out. Those are always fun to have. It may not be the weekly sale, but we have a large, large number of non-English cards that we just restocked on the website. You can get some good deals on so, some sweet non-English cards. So, so it looks like Ed D'Amico has beat Todd Stevens very quickly, two games to zero. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be right, but I'm sad to see Todd Stevens lose. Kevin is up a game over Jonathan Morawski. And Ben is up a game over Rob. So you are just wrong on almost all fronts. <laughs> yeah, so far. All the people that I picked to win, uh, except for one, lost their game once. <laughs> yeah. So uh, while these players are finishing up shuffling here, let's learn a little bit more about Joe Lissette. He plays Miracles a lot. We know he's from the West Coast, and this is his 21st open top eight. Yeah, Joe Lissette is really one of the staples of the Star City Tour. He is. He is on Team Nerd Range Gaming. He's 36 years of age from Redlands, California. He has 21 open top eights now, maybe even six wins, but he has five wins currently, two invitational top eights. He follows StarCraft II as closely as he follows Magic. He was a varsity rower for the University of Colorado, and he is a big Star Wars fanatic. My favorite point on there is the StarCraft II fan. I think StarCraft is just such a beautiful, beautiful game. Almost as good as Magic, but it's hard to be as good as Magic when Magic is just the world's greatest game ever in the history of the world. I agree. We also can learn a little bit more about Jeff Hoagland. He's 25 years of age from Bloomington, Illinois. 14 open top eights, now 15, with one invitational top eight. He's a stay-at-home dad with two awesome sons and future Magic players. He manages several open source coding projects, focusing on Linux, and he has a master's degree in mathematics. You know what I like about both of these players? What? Neither of them have decided they want to eat mustard on their pizza. <laughs> Yeah, I'll agree with that. I still cannot believe that. Kent Ketter. Mm -hmm. hey, hey, to each his own. My favorite thing, though, about Jeff Hoogland is he just is the, the ultimate brewmaster of the Star City Tour. He always comes with his unique take on the format, and he does well with it. He does, whether it's standard, paving the way for black-white control at the end of last standard yep. format when nobody was really playing it. Or this one now where he's, he's playing black-white-green. Playing Abzan Seasons Past. In Modern, he revolutionized the Kiki Chord deck. And now in Legacy, Modern Red Sneak Attack isn't a new deck. It is something that's been around and people have been playing it. But he is one of the few players who decided to champion it and pick up the helm to work on the deck. Yeah, and a lot of times that's kind of what originality is, is taking the discarded ideas of other people, polishing them off, realizing that there's something good there. Maybe it needs some tweaks, maybe it needs some updates. But Jeff Hoogland, uh, you know, like many of the great innovators of our time, is able to do that. All right, so we're going to gear up here for game two. For those of you just joining us, 
This is the quarterfinal match of the Worcester Open. On the SCG Tour, Joe Lissette is playing Miracles. Up, currently up a game against Jeff Hoagland on Mono Red Sneak Attack. Jeff's just going to play a mountain and pass. Joe has a Scalding Tarn and passing right back. Here's where things start to get a little scary. Yeah, a Blood Moon on the play is a lot more... Uh, uh, excuse me, a Blood Moon on turn two is a lot more threatening than it is on turn three, like in our previous game. But it looks like Jeff is going to be leading with the Trinisphere, which is also quite good. Yeah, so Jeff is going to fall to 18 and start off with a Trinisphere. This is going to make all spells cost at least three mana. This is, again, one of those old school cards. They just don't make them the way they used to. But this is a very, very powerful card, especially in Legacy. It does have a pretty big deck building cost because it is a symmetrical effect. But it is very, very powerful. And uh, it gives a lot of decks problems. They're just not built to handle this card. Well, Legacy as a format is just built around getting as much velocity as you can out of your deck with a bunch of one mana and two mana spells. Yep. And Trinosphere really, really hampers that. Joe is going to fire off a Brainstorm here in response after fetching an island out of his deck with the Scalding Tarn. Let's see what he finds. All right, Kevin King is going to win his match two games wow, to zero he takes over down the Reanimator. Animator Nemesis. I'll have to take another look at uh, Kevin King's sideboard. See if he was packing something like four surgical extractions. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm excited to see how this goes. Joe needs to develop a plan at this point. Either he has an answer for this Trinosphere, or he's going to need to develop enough of a mana base to slog through it. That said, one thing that's going to be particularly scary for Joe Lisset is... If he can't deal with this Trinosphere now, it basically guarantees that whatever Jeff Hoogland plays next, Joe isn't going to be able to counter. And even if Joe is able to counter it with the Force of Will, you know, he has to have one of the two remaining Force of Wills in his deck to be able to stop what Jeff decides to do next. So Joe is going to counter that with a Force of Will pitching a counterbalance. He's going to fall to 18. Jeff's just going to pass the turn. Joe has a Scalding Tarn and... Looks like he's just going to play another copy of Counterbalance. He's going to fall to 17 and fetch out likely another basic island. And I think that Joe has another planes in his hand, so he's likely safe from a Blood Moon. Ooh, but here is a boil B -b 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 -boil from Jeff Boyle. Boyle is such a sick card. We are going to get a Counterbalance oh. trailer, and there are, there are a couple fours in Joe's deck. This card is insane. Talk about a wrecking bomb. Yeah. Double Stone Rain at this point. And early in the game, and we see Jeff trying to uh, just disrupt Joe's raw resources. This is basically, you know, how he builds up uh, his power is with his lands, and Jeff is just taking those right out. All right, well, there is a Tundra for Joe. Jeff is going to play a Through the Breach. All right, we're going to get Jeff a Gristlebrand here. And Jeff is sensing weakness. He also has a Blood Moon that he could cast, but he's saying... You know, if my boil resolved, I bet my through the breach will resolve. And with seven fresh cards, a more developed mana base than Joe Lissette, Jeff is just going to be able to have his way with this game. So he's going to draw seven and fall down to seven. Let's see how many Lotus Petals and Simeon Spirit Guides he finds here. He's going to attack for seven, and Joe is going to Swords to Plowshares the Gristlebrand. It will go away. Jeff is going to gain seven life back up to 14, but he does have seven fresh cards in hand. Now Jeff is going to likely have to discard due to hand size, but he's going to be able to keep enough stuff so that he's probably going to have not only an impressive follow-up, but uh, an additional impressive play after that even. Jeff is going to play a mountain and sacrifice his City of Traders. Joe's in a really tough spot, too. He really needs this counterbalance to do some serious overtime in, in terms of work because Joe doesn't actually have enough resources uh, to counter all the cards that Jeff has access to. So he's going to need that counterbalance to do some serious work. Well, Jeff's going to play a Lotus Petal. Counterbalance is going to reveal a Flooded Strand and counter it. He is going to just play that Strand and pass back to Jeff. Let's see what Jeff can put together now.
So with that crystal veins, I think that Jeff has access to six mana here. And so he's going to tap four and play sneak attack, falling down to 12. He's going to get a counterbalance trigger. Joe is going to sacrifice his Flood Strand, falling to 16 in response. He's going to find a basic island. Let's see what he has to interact with Jeff here. And Joe Lawset is the... Uh, the shining beacon of light for Nerd Rage Gaming to see if they can secure another title for their team. It's going to be a land on top. It is going to resolve. Jeff is going to activate Sneak Attack and put another Grizzlebrand onto the battlefield. The only thing better than one Grizzlebrand is two Grizzlebrands. He's going to exile Simeon Spirit Guide oh, and man. Sneak and Attack and Inferno Titan. And this, this could be a knockout punch. This is going to be lethal if Joe does not have another source to plowshares or some way to block. Inferno Titan really is a sweet card. This is a card that I always wondered if I could play in just Sneak and Show, and just being able to, you know, sneak attack it in and having it be good, but also having the option of just hard casting it later on, which is something that Mono Red Sneak Attack does quite well. All right, well, Jeff is going to attack with his, sim with his Inferno Titan and Gristlebrand. The trigger's gonna go up top, and Joe is gonna pack it up. Jeff Hoagland is gonna even this match up one to one as we go into the third game here. He was able to force Joe to use a Force of Will early, and they just didn't have anything for the next few spells that Jeff decided to slam onto the battlefield. Yeah, Jeff Kuglin just had an onslaught of must counter spells, and Joe just didn't have enough counter spells. He needed more time to set up shop and make better use of counterbalance. So do we think that either of these players are going to change their sideboarding up at all? No, I think the cards that are good in the matchup are just good in the matchup, and the, the tempo doesn't change anything. Fair enough. Now, uh, these two decks are, uh, well, Miracles is a very common deck that you find in Legacy, but Mono Red Sneak Attack isn't. Uh, it is a deck, however, that you hear random people talk about every now and then, and you might even see it get featured in something like the StarCityGames.com newsletter, where it is your source for Magic the Gathering news. You can get the latest on the SCG Tour, watch the SCG Tour Match of the Week, receive exclusive deck lists and advice, catch up on all event on all event results, read an exclusive Cardboard Crack comic. You can sign up absolutely for free. Go.StarCityGames.com slash newsletter for more details. And the newsletter has a lot of great writers like me, Chris, Cedric, Craig Kremples, a lot of other great, great players. And it, if you're looking for one thing to read during the week, this is that one thing that'll keep you up to date on all the hot things that are going on in the Magic community. Again, it's absolutely free. Go.StarCityGames.com slash newsletter. It is your source for Magic the Gathering news. <coughs> so, all right. Well, it looks like Mog Catcher has won Mog two Catcher games in a on. row, and Rob Blocker is going to defeat Ben Friedman. Our eighth seed is going to topple the number one seed and move on to our semifinals. And that, and that is a, you know, I I did put. Uh, predict that the Mog Catcher deck was, would win, but that is a good underdog story and a bit of an upset, because Ben Friedman, he's a, he's a seasoned veteran on the SCG Tour. He was the number one seed. He did better than anyone else in the Swiss, and for him to lose to the bottom seed, who's playing uh, this rather bizarre deck, quite frankly, um, you know, by legacy standards even, it's one that we haven't seen in a long, long time, is, uh, is quite the story. It really is. Uh, ben Friedman, this is his ninth open top eight, and he won Baltimore back in 2011. One interesting little tidbit, if Rob can win in the top four and Jeff makes it to the finals, we, would have we will have a mono-red sneak attack versus Mog Catcher finals of this Legacy Open. Yeah, that is something certainly to work, uh, make note of, is we have two fringe mono-red prison-style decks in our <laughs> top eight. Which is uh, phenomenal. <laughs> this format is great. If yeah. anybody still thinks that Brainstorm is oppressing this format, look at this top eight. Yeah, we've absolutely. got a Lance deck. We've got a Mog Catcher deck. <laughs> we've got a Mono Red Sneak Attack deck. Granted, there are five Brainstorm decks, but 
you can be successful if you try and go off the beaten path. Yeah, and it, it's also really revealing this top eight to see that there really is a lot of brewing that you can still do in the format. A lot of times people think, oh, Legacy, it's so old, everything's been figured out. It's just lands, Delver, and uh, miracles, but you're seeing some fringe decks rise to the surface. You're also seeing some standard decks have some unique flavors. True Name Nemesis is coming back. Joe Lissette has uh, Venser Shaper Savant and the three Van Dillen clicks, which is really unique. And you have these brews bubbling to the surface. And it just really goes to show you can do anything in Legacy. You just need to work hard at it. Looks like Jeff is going to keep his seven, but Joe is going to take a quick trip to Paris. Let's see if he can find a keepable six plus a scry here. I really like the, the new Vancouver mulligan rule. It's not that new anymore, but it really makes it feel like the first mulligan isn't that bad. You know, being, being with a six card hand and a scry isn't a whole lot different than a seven card hand, especially in a matchup where tempo really matters. Yeah. That, that mulligan isn't likely to affect you until the sixth or seventh turn of the game. All right, well, Joe is going to take a look at his six. He's going to keep it. The scry is going to go right back on top where it started. He's going to lead off on a tundra and pass the turn. And we'll see. In game one, Joe was able to pick and choose what he wanted to interact with and save his force of wills until he could hard cast them. We'll see how he is able to manage his resources in this situation, how much pressure Jeff can lay on him in those opening turns. Usually it's been around turn two that Jeff does something powerful, and we'll have to see what he does here. All right, well, Jeff starts out with a mountain and a lotus petal. Joe just has a tundra and a arid mesa. But on Jeff's second turn, he's going to take two damage from an ancient tomb and just hard cast a simian spirit guide. I, I really thought he was laying that on the board to make a red man who's gonna put in sneak attack, but then he just passed, and I was like, what? No, sometimes you just gotta play a 2-2 and attack. It's kind of like a curd ape. That's a good beatdown card. The old gray ogre. Yeah. I've played a few gray ogres. I, so uh, before all of the sneak and show stuff happened. So it's, like, it's kind of like before Emrakul kind of We were going off. to story time. Before, actually, it was more so before Gristlebrand. Mm -hmm. uh, I played Hivemind when it was popular in oh, cool. Legacy. And I won so many games just making a 4 forward Pact of the Titan and attacking. Oh, yeah. nice. It's just insane. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to play your Seaman Spirit Guide in battle. Yep. And Joe is going to brainstorm on Jeff's end step. Going to take his turn, play another fetch line, and pass back. And here we are going to get Simeon Spirit Guide beat down. And this is one. Yeah, and this is kind of an interesting play because on the one hand, uh, Jeff is on the draw. So he's uh, a little bit behind than he, uh, as compared to the previous two games. And if he assumes that Joe is probably just going to counter his first couple spells, he might as well just lead off with some sort of pressure that Joe really doesn't want to use a counter spell on. And the Simeon Spirit Guide is the perfect way to do that. The Simeon Spirit Guide might not do a whole lot, but it might mean that maybe a, a follow-up Emrakul or Grizzlebrand ends up one-shotting Joe rather than just reducing his life total. Well, Jeff is going to fall to 16, play a Chalice for one. Joe is going to fall to 16 himself and crack a couple fetch lands on his end step. Looks like we're going to get an island and something else. Looks like he had a copy of Wear and Tear in his hand, so he might might potentially just use the wear portion of wear and tear to get rid of that chalice of the void, then untap into something like Jace the Mind Sculptor could be good on this board. If Joe doesn't have any one mana spells that he wants to fire off immediately, he may also just hold on to his wear tear and maybe wait for a moment where he can get a sneak attack and the chalice off the table at the same time. Well, get a nice two for one. Here's the Vendillion click, and that's going to show us World Spine Worm, Gristlebrand, Spirit Guide, Spirit Guide, Inferno Titan. Woof, that's a bunch of, bunch, bunch of fatties. Yeah, and if Joe wasn't worried about counter spells, he could potentially hard cast this Inferno Titan by discarding both of those Simeon Spirit Guides to make that play uh, and risk it getting countered would put Jeff Hoogland way behind on resources. Do you take anything here if you're Joe? <laughs> Uh, it depends. If he, I, I think he has access to a Force of Will, so I would be inclined to just leave the cards there just so I know what I have to deal with. And mm -hmm. for the most part, those cards aren't actually that threatening on their own. 
All right, well, Joe is just going to leave those cards in Jeff Hoagland's hand. Let's see if he can find a fourth land for that Jace that's in his hand. And it looks like he did. Vendanian Click is going to attack Jeff down to 13. And Joe Lissette is winning this race currently. Yep. And again, we see Joe opting to try to interact <coughs> as little as possible. And so even though he has a wear tear, he's looking to do more proactive things rather than react to that chalice because he knows that for the time being, he can get away with it. All right, so Joe is nice enough to show yeah, us that there's a the boil, boil on top of the deck. <laughs> so let's see what he decides to do with that boil. He does have a forcible in the hand to stop it, but do, do you want to have to use it? Well, it's a little interesting because, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think he wants to use it. Well, he's going to put it on the bottom. Jeff is going to draw another chalice in the void. And it looks like Jeff is going to try to play this uh, Inferno Titan. It's a little bit of a scary play, though, because not only could it get counterspelled, but it could also just get bounced by the Jace. The fact that Jeff hasn't attacked yet, though, if that uh, Titan resolved, uh, it would be able to shoot three damage at the Jace, and the Simeon Spear God would be able to finish it off. All right, so Force of Will is going to stop that Simeon Spirit Guide, or to stop the Inferno Titan. Jeff is going to attack Joe's Jace down to three counters. Jeff's going to crash back with Medellin Click, going to knock Jeff down to eight. And we're going to Fate Seal Jeff Hoagland yet again. This Joe just has to fade some interactive cards here for a couple of, well, some acceleration cards here for just a couple draw steps. And this game is, is pretty close. Things could turn around, but it's looking pretty bad for Jeff right now. He doesn't have access to much mana. Uh, the City of Traders is certainly uh, a big boon in regards to that, but he's not really operating on all the, the cylinders that he wants to. All right, well, Joe is going to attack Jeff down to five with the Vendayan click. He's going to Fate Seal Jeff yet again. Jeff does have five mana available to him, though. Yeah, a card like Through the Breach would be a great top deck for Jeff Hoogland. He needs to find it real fast, though. All right, well, Joe is going to leave a Lotus Petal on top, and Jeff is going to scoop him up. And we have Joe Lissette moving on to the top four. Again, the Miracles Master taking down the Brew Master. And... Uh, you know, it's going to be a, a little bit of an upset in my mind. I thought that, that Jeff would be able to take it. It was close. It seemed like that in that third game he had a little bit of a weaker draw. But Jola said I think the, the hallmark of why he won was he was able to just pick and choose what to interact with. And rather than interacting with everything, he was able to navigate the matchup in a way where he interacted with as little as possible. 